Jesus. Marvelous Savior. Redeemer of our lives. Into your presence. Into your presence. Oh, we come today. We come to say thank you, Jesus. Into your presence, Lord. Into your presence, Lord, we come today to say thank you, Jesus. Into your presence today, we have come here to say thank you, Jesus, marvelous Savior of my life. Oh, we've come here today. I'm here to say today, thank you, Jesus. Thank somebody worship the Lord. Oh, 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 yeah. Woo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're marvelous in every way, beautiful God. You are the worthy one. You are the worthy one. We press in. We press into the throne room today before you in your glory and your presence. We glory in your presence. My Lord, my God, yeah. we glory in your presence. nothing else will do I'm caught up in your presence I just wanna sit here at your feet caught up in this
Jesus, you don't owe me anything more than anything that you can do. I just want you, Lord. I just. Nothing else, Lord, nothing else. I've learned through this life of mine, these years that I've been serving you. Nothing else will do but you and you alone, Lord. But you and you alone for the glory of your presence. The glory of who you are. Your very person, Jesus, the glory of who you are. Great I am, great I am, the glory of who you are, the glory of your presence, the glory, yeah. Oh, your glory, the glory of your presence, it consumes me, Lord, it consumes me, Lord, the glory of your presence, Isaiah 60 said, come on, come on, you guys, why don't you arise and shine, arise and shine and give God the glory. So today we come in your presence, Lord, we're arising and we're, we're shining like Isaiah 60 said, arise, shine, for the glory of the Lord is risen. prophetic worship journey we've had multiple words Lord we have to document now our prophetic worship journey so that others might see and might know and might learn from it Lord I thank you that Carla has been your spiritual historian not just mine not just 47 years of marriage and 48 years of worship but you've given her a special gift, Lord, as a spiritual historian documenting all that happened in our lives since 1974. That is truly amazing, Lord. Thank you for this long extended run of leading worship, knowing you and your presence deep in worship. We pray that these times now, Lord, may bless the nations and bless real people to go further, go deeper, and go wider in your presence, Lord, according to your word and your Holy Spirit. I pray it now, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Woo! <laughs> so today, Carla is in her, her recliner chair over there, and we begin what we're calling our prophetic worship journey, documenting through the years. Last summer, married 47 years, we said, how can it be? We're only 39. <laughs> but we came to this place where my good friend Dan McMahon, probably four or five years ago, said, Kent, love you in front of a camera, a keyboard, teaching, instructing, great. But let's get Carla in front of a camera and document her life as a spiritual historian for the Lord watching you doing what you're doing and that she locked all that up she rarely forgets anything 
So uh, I'm going to give it to Carla right now. We go back to our new, our first church, New Covenant Fellowship. And wherever you want to go, Carla, what are you saying today? Well, it's <laughs> best to start from the beginning. And I thought about uh, probably the best place to start would be how I met Kent. So um, my oldest sister, Cherie, and her husband, Arno, they were stationed, they were, he was in the Air Force, and they were stationed just south of Houston in Sugar Land or Pasadena or something like that. Cherie had gotten involved with some Pentecostals down there, and Connie, if you're listening, that would be you. Uh, she had gotten involved with some Pentecostals, and I went down to visit her over Thanksgiving in 1973. So the Sunday after that, Thanksgiving, 1973, I met Jesus. Wow. And uh, wow. it, was, it was dramatic. It was uh, like I, I was in the presence of God at that point in my life, and I haven't left it wow. at, at any wow. stage. Yes. I have not left the presence of God since that day that <sighs> I went forward to receive <laughs> Jesus. So I came back from that trip, and uh, I had been going to church with my mom, to her Lutheran church, and I, I just knew I had to do something. I had to do something to serve the Lord. So I went to my pastor, and I said, what can I do to help? What's, is there something I can volunteer to do? And he said, well, we have an opening on the communion committee or the worship committee. And I thought, the worship committee, now that sounds really good. So I, I decided to help with the worship committee, and in the first worship committee meeting, I met a lady by the name of Joyce Lynn. Joyce was a member of our church. She was also on the worship committee. And I asked the question that night of all these Lutheran ladies that were sitting there, if anyone had ever heard anyone speak in tongues. <laughs> and the reason why I said that was because Pentecostal holiness people believed that you had to tarry for the Holy Spirit. So at this point in my life, I was tarrying for the Holy Spirit. So later on that evening, Joyce called me and she said, hey, I have this prayer meeting, this teaching, uh, teacher comes over and, and, and teaches at my house every Monday night. I'd like you to, to invite you to come over. And so I went over to Charlie and Joyce's house that, uh, that Monday, took my sister, always took my, Shirley was always in tow wherever I went, Shirley was with me. And uh, there was a teacher there that night. His name was Bob McKee and his wife, Ruth. And there was a young man there who wanted to get filled with the Spirit. And so they just shared the scripture with him on how to receive the Holy Spirit. While we're laying hands on him, I'm thinking, well, that's it. I'm getting it too. <laughs> and so that evening I got filled with the Spirit. That was in February of 1974. So now fast forward. I'm on the worship committee. And one of the things that I started doing was writing the contemporary services. Back in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, back in the 70s, they would kind of go off the script uh, once a month, and they'd do what they call a contemporary service, where, you know, it was, it was they used basically the scripture that's sent out in the programs, but changed the service up. So I started doing those, writing some of those, and, uh, and I, it came up to, uh, like July, I think July of 74, and I had written one of the services, and I had included all of the music that I had been hearing over at the youth meeting at New Covenant Fellowship. Well, Charlie and Joyce had told me about New Covenant, and so I started going over there to the youth meeting on Saturday night, and I had met one of the people in, in the worship team. His name was Dave McClanahan, and I thought, well, I'll just get one of those guitar players from New Covenant come over at the 8.30 service in the morning and, well, and because, help me with this. Because your piano player was on vacation when you got the contemporary service going, and she no, didn't know any of the songs. Well, she was there, but she didn't know any of the songs. Right. Because I didn't have any music. And this is back in the day of, you know, worship choruses in Charles Monroe and, you know, and, and New Creation Singers. The, there was no music. There was no printed music. And I'm not a musician, so I had this bright idea, well, I'll get a musician to come over and, and help me, and we'll lead these together. And so that night, that Saturday night, I went to the youth meeting, and I was in, on the hunt for Dave McClanahan, who's the only person that I had met on the worship team. 
and he wasn't there. So I was sweating bullets during the whole service. <laughs> when the service was over, I thought, what am I going to do? And about that time, the crowd kind of parted, and I saw Kent standing there. So I just walked over to him and, and said, have you seen Dave McClanahan? And he goes, uh, no, he's not here tonight. Why? What do you need? And so I proceeded to tell him what happened. He goes, oh, I'll come and do it. So he came over to my Lutheran church at 8.30 the next morning, and he helped me do all the songs, and it was wonderful. The service was wonderful. Uh, everything was great. Everybody there loved it at, at church, and they just thought he was another good Lutheran boy. You know, he went to communion and the whole nine yards. <laughs> well, and, and let, let me stop just for a minute, hon, because I want people to know that you were, we just figured this out. We never kept the dates, and we didn't talk about it. But you were spirit-filled February of 1974. I was spirit-filled two months later, Easter night, April of 1974. I had just started leading worship June of 1974 when she came up in July when the crowd parted. I, I had seen Carla, and I was on the lookout to try to meet her and not be a stalker. <laughs> and so when the, it was like our youth group, we want you to know, grew to over 1,500 to 2,000 kids in, in really a year and a half. And it was the Holy Spirit, which is why we're documenting our prophetic worship journey. But if you do the math on this, this is the way the hand of the Lord is coming to work, I believe, right now. You're going to see brand new believers touched by the Holy Spirit that just a few months later, they're going to be helping lead stuff. They're going to be being discipled and all that. So when I look back at it, I said, Carla, look at the hand of the Lord for us, I mean, I was a Catholic kid that stopped going when I was 12 or 13, and I was just out to lunch. Now, I had been born again, but when you look at the date, February of 74, at a home meeting, Carla was spirit-filled because another guy wanted to be. Then I got spirit-filled at a Newman House Center at the end of a folk mass, believe it or not, that was April of 74. And Ron Tucker at that point, I'm pretty sure it was him that came up and said, we heard you play guitar, start on the worship team. That was June. So think of that, February, April, June. And Carla comes up. Now, I had learned all these songs. I had a 12-string guitar, and that's why I was able to go over, and it was on. And by the way, when I did that service, the Lutheran people, me not knowing any better, had a closed altar rail, a, altar, a communion rail, meaning if you're not Lutheran, they don't serve you. But when I went up, the pastor, I guess, was kind enough to do it. But then that's how Carl and I met. Back to you, Yeah, and interesting, prior to that, when I got saved and, and spirit-filled, the Lord just uh, just led me to to read. I read, the, the first book I read was uh, Identification by E.W. Kenyon. Oh, man. And uh, man. I somehow I got a hold of New Wine magazine, and I started subscribing to New Wine, which had wonderful articles in it. And a lot of advertising. So they, they advertise for albums and I, I wound up buying like Love Song and you know the things that things that were coming out of California. Because when I went to the youth meeting the first time, I had never seen anything like that before. I was raised Catholic. I had gone to Mass and I had gone to Lutheran Church. And uh, but there this was a band and young people and they were they were doing, you know, <laughs> modern kind of music and we were singing and it was exciting. And when I first started going there, there were probably about 75 kids. And we had just moved into a brand new building uh, that Bob Beckett had, had built for New Covenant Fellowship. And he had invited Ron Tucker to bring his youth over to that new building and kind of joined, joined up together. And actually, when I first started going in the summer, Ron wasn't even there. He was over in England. And so I never met him for like the first month that we start that I started going to church there. But it just grew and grew and grew like crazy. It was exciting times. The presence of God was was incredible. The music wow. was incredible. We would go for two hours just in worship. Uh, the right. door would open at six o'clock and there'd be 100, 150 kids standing outside the door just waiting to oh, get in. Yeah. When, when they unlocked it and opened it, they'd come in, run in, and throw their Bibles down on the chairs. We'd go to the back room, which was a, the nursery, and do pre-service prayer, which was another thing that was probably unheard of, that they would pray for an hour before the service started. 
and because the service started at seven, and so uh, that was that was our beginning, and uh, it was right after that happened where Ken came over and helped me do that service that we wound up becoming prayer partners, and uh, he asked me uh, to go to to a Catholic charismatic prayer group with him on a Friday night at St. Anne's. And so I went, that was our, our first date, and that was the Friday after the Sunday. So I uh, went to St. Anne's with him, and I thought, hmm, this is interesting. It was it was the Catholic uh, charismatic. folk masses that they were yeah. doing, you know, and, uh, and but these were all charismatics. And then he proceeded to tell me that he, he was also involved with All Souls, the Life and the Spirit seminars on Monday nights, and then he also did St. Jude's on Tuesday nights. So I started going to these Catholic charismatic groups with him and, uh, and just began, we began to minister together. And it was three weeks, three weeks in, three weeks from the first time that we went to St. Anne's. And we're driving back to St. Anne's. We're on Midland Boulevard. And he turns and he asks me to marry him. <laughs> three weeks. And, and she, I said yes. And she said yes, and it freaked me out. I went, okay, now what am I going to do? Well, she said, so it was really the hand of the Lord and the Spirit moving. We didn't, We said that's probably not a pattern for dating <laughs> for most parents, but it was powerful. Well, and the this three is... prayer meetings, which I isn't it ironic, are very powerful that the Lord sent me back into Catholic circles all Souls a Church was the grade school I grew, I grew up in until eighth grade, and then I went to our seventh grade. Uh, no, it was eighth grade. I went to Rittner Junior Public High School, Rittner High School. But during that time, we, we, we were just full out operating in the Spirit. Everything was about the Lord Jesus. And we, we wanted to look like Him. Well, some of us did. We had long hair, talk like Him, act like Him. We were totally absorbed in the things of God. And we were not distracted. I remember, why would I be doing St. Jude's Charismatic Catholic meeting, All Souls? And by the way, at All Souls, some of the teachers that taught me in grade school were spirit-filled in the basement of All Souls Catholic School. I'm telling you, it's coming again. I believe that us doing our prophetic worship history, however, however many times we do this, it could be 18 or 20 or 10, I don't know. But it, we're, we're saying this is what you can pray about and see it happen again. I believe that we're on the verge of a great awakening and the outpouring of his Holy Spirit. Uh, and, but that was so powerful that Carla said, yeah, let's I'll do all three of the Catholic care. You could have said, well, no, I'm going to be home. I got a favorite TV program. N none of that. We were like full out for the Lord. There was a lot going on in the spirit. God was really pouring out his spirit on all denominations back yes. in those days. I mean, we, Visitation Academy, uh, where there was powerful stuff going on. Father McNutt, Francis McNutt was there. And uh, so a lot of things were happening in breaking down the denominational barriers. <laughs> and for some reason, God decided to use New Covenant Fellowship as one of those gathering places for people from all over. We had kids from every denomination. We had adults that were coming, you know, that had come out of Baptist backgrounds and Presbyterian backgrounds. And we had Catholic nuns that were coming on wow, Saturday night awesome. to check it out. And it was really growing very, very rapidly. And uh, it was it, at the same time that was happening with us here in the Midwest, the Jesus movement was going on out in California. And at the same time that was happening, there was an outpouring of, of modern music that was happening at Christ for the Nations. And uh, just amazing, amazing music was coming out of there. But one of the things that we had at New Covenant in that youth group was we had some amazing talent there as well. I mean, we had Charlie and Jill LeBlanc were, were with our group. Carla Real was with our group. Uh, Kent and, and Ron, Ron Tucker, Ron Tucker, a, a number of years later, wound up being one of the one of the people that Charisma Magazine talked about as these young up and coming pastors that were going to pastor mega churches. Him and Billy Joe Dougherty, and so anyway, it was a time that was it was very exciting. We couldn't wait to get to church. The kids. Huh. 
The kids that came were literally on fire for Jesus. They were bringing their friends, and it was just growing by leaps and bounds. And, Hunt, I want you to talk about worship. I want to go back just a minute to out of Catholic Catholicism, then Lutheran at Beautiful Savior Lutheran Church. But when you came, like me, I saw people lifting their hands. The first time I saw, I was in a small group, an A-frame uh, church over on West County here in St. Louis, uh, Assembly of God Church. They had an old aid frame building they were meeting in, and I was in the basement. I remember the first time I saw people lift their hands. I actually got there for the rehearsal. Uh, this was right before I was spirit-filled, <clears throat> and I remember these people were playing, you know, doing these cool songs, and they went in the kitchenette area and closed the little sh shutter doors, and they all were praying in the spirit. I didn't know it then. They were praying in their prayer language or praying in tongues. And as I listened to them, I thought, oh, my God, they're a bunch of foreign exchange students. I mean, I thought they were talking to each other <laughs> in different language I understood. But that's when I understand, no, that's the power of God. There's something different what they're doing. And when they came out, I'll never forget it, a guy named Jim Kapushiak, which they call him Cap. We all <laughs> shortened his last name. He started worshiping God. It was so intimate with the Lord. I remember, see, I never seen anybody lift their hands. I got chills right now. Oh, my God. Wow. He started worshiping the Lord. And I went, I don't know what that is, but I want it. Oh, my God. And I think the power of the presence of Almighty God, of the Lord Jesus, was so invasive, we're, we weren't even sure what was going on. We were, You were 22. I was 20 years old when all this hit. And so it proves that God can do something at a high level. But go back and talk about worship for a minute, and, you know, your first experience and what happened on Saturday night. So the worship, they would just get started. Ron and Kent would lead worship together, and they would just get started with some worship choruses. And then all of a sudden they'd just start playing some chord progressions and the kids that were out in the in the crowd would just take over and it would be it would come in like waves where you'd just be singing in the spirit and dancing and and shouting and clapping and it was it was phenomenal it, it, like i said it came in waves and it would go we would go for a good hour and a half just in worship uh in that youth meeting and then Ron would get up, and he was, Ron was extremely anointed as a young man. He, he could preach and teach, and uh, he, was, he was teaching discipleship back in the day because he had just come back from, from England. Bob Beckett had sent him over to England to be discipled by Bryn Jones. And so when he came back, he gathered up 16 guys from the youth meeting to help him to lead it because he, he didn't want to do this alone. And so these 16 young men would get together on Monday night and they would study things together. And they started with E.W. Kenyon's New Creation Realities. God. Wow. The thing that happened to this, all these young people at this youth meeting was they got set free from sin. Whew. They got set free to be new creatures in Christ understanding who they were and they were no longer slaves to sin and holiness wow. became a hallmark <sighs> among our young people wow. i mean there was no coarse jesting there was no you know no cursing i mean when kids got saved and filled with the spirit god cleaned up their act immediately and they got respectful to their parents and it started filtering down into the big church <clears throat> And the adults in the church were wondering, what on earth is going on? This, these youth are, there's as many youth here as there are adults. And that's what happened with our first church. It just grew and grew and grew. Uh, Bob Beckett, who was a, a spirit-filled Baptist, you know, he was a young man as well. And we didn't even realize it back in the day that he was only in his 30s when all this was going on. And so... He uh, he dubbed the the uh, new covenant the new covenant the building the sheep shed <laughs> because he called us all sheep we were God's sheep <laughs> and that it was a fellowship because we were two fellows in a ship. <laughs>
And so it was things like that, that, <clears throat> that just, uh, it just grew and grew and became like the, the hub for the charismatic renewal in the St. Louis area. Well, and I want to go for just a second on not the power of the music, but the power of his presence. We were so young, like you were just saying about Pastor Bob Beckett, who was our senior pastor. I think he was 35 or 36, and Dave McClanahan was 32, the guy you were looking for to lead worship at, at Beautiful Savior Lutheran Church. And we thought, man, those guys are ancient of days, you know, because we were like in our early 20s. But it, it was like the Lord marked us. We were marked by the Lord for spending time in his presence and spreading that to hundreds, if not thousands of other people. Because people have said, Kent, how in the world or in the kingdom did you ever get started doing this? And I said, it was almost like automatic in the Holy Spirit because we were spirit filled, freshly spirit filled. And uh, we just wanted to live full out for the Lord. So I remember this a story we're sharing uh, well, first of all, I was a lead singer in a band at 13 years of age, and I, I was, you know, lead singer in a band till I was born again when I was 19. I was spirit filled when I was 20. I played guitar at 11. So in a sense, all the stuff I learned in music, I mean, we were bringing, when Carla said, because I want to document this, well, they would sing a, a chorus. And by the way, back in the day, a scripture song or scripture chorus had one verse and one chorus. There really weren't any bridges. It was real simple stuff, and we were focused on the Lord. We weren't focused on having a meeting or having an event. We were focused on the Lord, and that's why out of a simple verse and chorus, we would start singing freestyle in the spirit, meaning we kept the chord progression going out of the song we were currently doing, and then people started singing in tongues or singing in English or singing in their native tongue. And that was some kind of power of the presence of the Lord. I keep thinking of the song, Jesus is passing by. Well, he wasn't just passing by on our Saturday night youth group. He stayed, he came and he stayed because there's no way we could have produced that kind of fruit. Just think of the number of kids that were saved and spirit filled. And actually, a number, it was probably a couple years after, we, we ran for about two and a half to three years when we saw the couple thousand kids every Saturday night. And they said, you ended up touching between seven to 10,000 young people, both teenagers and college age. Think of this. The Lord will do it again. What'd you say, Kent? I said, the Lord will do it again. He's going to do it again. And just think, we didn't know anything. We, we kept, we stayed in the word all the time. We knew that that was really important. But the power of the Lord's presence is the power of the Lord's presence. In other words, he doesn't need our help. It wasn't because I was a good singer or because Ron was a good guitar player or because we had a certain stylistic approach. The power of his presence came and was released and it will work at a super high level. We we will see, I believe, a return of, and that's why we're doing our prophetic worship journey. What you're going to see in different parts as we go through the next few months is documenting that, that we might believe God again. So the power of the person of the Lord Jesus, think about it. Jesus came to this earth, born of a virgin. He was born in, in, into a clay suit, into humanity. He, he died on the cross, rose again from the dead, and now has made a new and living way into his presence. That's what happened. And it was surely by the hand of the Lord in divine providence. And uh, so I'm going to hand back to Carla again. In those moments and hours, what were the things you saw happen either? And we'd have altar calls, people getting healed. We didn't even know what we we're doing. But what were some of the supernatural things that happened over that three-year period? Well, it just came so naturally. I mean, it was naturally supernatural. It's what I used to always, I always thought about that when, when Ron would be leading these meetings, how it was so natural for him to operate, you know, in the supernatural. It wasn't spooky. It wasn't like you had to do something to get ready for it. It just was flowing out of this lifestyle that we had, uh, uh, for instance, Kent's friend Larry Mintz. Larry had this car, and it was a it was an old green car. And one night he picked up Kent 
And he said, hey, listen, we got to get Charlie filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so they go over, they pick up Charlie. And of course, this is an old car with one of those bench seats in the front. Yeah, it was a Chevy s s sedan with the scoop bat 1953 Chevy, which is what I learned to, to yeah, drive we, on. Yeah, we called it the praise mobile. <laughs> so they pick up Charlie, they put him in the middle, and they drive around with Larry and Kent screaming in tongues until Charlie got filled with the Spirit. And, <laughs> I mean, Charlie leads worship for Andrew Romack now, he and his wife, Jill. I mean, it's... it's and the, and the other thing about a lot of these kids that, that wound up there, that, you know, got their experience with God, are still pillars in the church. They are still leaders in this area. They're elders. They're pastors. They're, they continued on. It's not something that they backslid out of. There wasn't anything. There was no backsliding. There was only going forward. We just kept going forward. And, and doing more and more and you know as the Lord we saw miracles we saw I I personally Kent and I personally prayed for this this uh, baby that was deaf and it wound up hearing and just things like that people getting up out of wheelchairs people you know leaving their crutches when they come and they do this on Saturday night we had a lot of adults and the elders started coming in, you know, because it was it was a phenomenon that happened. At one point, there was a young man who showed up on on Ron and Ken's doorstep. Ken wound up becoming the work, the music director there when he graduated from college. And so Ron and Kent were the only two that were on staff. And they used to go in the nursery every, you know, uh, every morning when they'd come in. And they would intercede. They would pray. God. And Ron tells the story of how here's this, you know, kind of introverted, you know, some of a God kid in a room with Kent Henry. And he's praying and jumping off the walls. <laughs> you know, he was so bombastic. But they prayed together in the spirit. And That's things good. were happening. It was setting the stage for what God wanted to do with these young people. And so there's a young man who's, you know, got, got a work down in Rosebud, Missouri, who starts hearing about this. And he's like, you know, I, I, I don't believe that the gifts of the Spirit are for today. I think that they died with the apostles. But I keep hearing about this youth meeting. And so he came up on Saturday night and he came up early enough to come in to the pre-service prayer. And he would lay on the floor in the corner while all these kids were praying and he would argue with God about how this can't be of God. <laughs> this is just, I, I know this can't be because all the gifts died with the apostles, but it's so anointed and he'd have this argument with God. And then he started making appointments to come up and talk with Ron and, and Kent about these questions that he had. Well, that young man was Mike Bickle. Wow. And if you've heard anything about Mike Bickle, he heads up the International House of Prayer in Kansas City with a history that's amazing. Yes. And that's how he started. He started there in the sheep shed, laying on the floor in the nursery, listening to a bunch of kids praying in the spirit and worshiping God before the service, an hour wow. before the service. Wow. <clears throat> this is the kind of thing that has to come back. It has to come back to the body of Christ. That hunger and that zeal and, and, and pour the life of God back into it. The life of God is the thing that motivated and accelerated and did everything and, and accomplished everything that was accomplished there before the devil blew it up. Well, and so we document the power of his presence first uh, deep worship second, that we hung out in the presence. We weren't in a hurry. And then basically there was prayer and intercession. Obviously the word of God covers it all. And um, we're, we're in a place right now where believe God, believe God for the millennials and even the Z generation or whatever's below the millennials. The reason we're documenting this is that we've had a number of people out of the blue will call Carla and said, 
hey, you need to document what happened so people know it can happen again. It is the book of Acts, by the way. I wouldn't compare what we did to the book of Acts. I mean, parallel, exact parallel. But it was the power of the Holy Spirit moving on. I mean, a bunch of kids that were un unregenerate. Um, I remember getting phone calls from parents. What have you done to my children? And they were unsaved. So they were very not very kind on their phone calls because their kids were going home, you know, spirit filled and full of the full of the fruit of the spirit. And their parents didn't like it. And then their parents got saved. In spirit. So it's a spreading out. So for right now, we're documenting this in the name of Jesus <clears throat> that we might pray. And again, hit the power of his presence doesn't need any help he's jesus he is the worthy one the one that can change any human heart on any human level at any time but giving ourselves more to worship intercession and prayer this would be an idea of the hour right now so father we pray and we bless you for these times and we thank you for an outpouring of your holy spirit we're saying you'll pour out your Holy Spirit again. You're going to do it similarly, differently. We don't care, Lord. We just say in these generations on the earth, three or four generations right now, come and pour out your Holy Spirit like you did in the book of Acts. We give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. And I would like to take this moment to encourage you that if God's given you some ideas if God's prompting you to do something in the, in the area of reaching out to young people, do it. Do it exactly how God tells you to do it. And it's not video arcades and fun and games or roller skating or any of that activities that you know church groups have done in the past. It's not any of that. What draws young people is lifting up Jesus and following after, do, do the naturally supernatural things that are in your life to do. The Holy Spirit lives in you and the Holy Spirit has creativity out the kazoo. And, and whatever it is he's telling you to do, do it because he wants to pour out his spirit even more now than he did then.